Tonight we're going to look at chapter 3 of our study as we continue our study of the Gospel of John. Now, at first glance, when you look at chapter 3, uh, it seems to consist of two separate parts. You've got the, uh, you've got the encounter with Nicodemus. And then you've got the comparison of John the Baptist with, with Jesus, talking about So verses 1 through 21 is talking about the encounter with Nicodemus. And then beginning in verse 22 through, I think it's 22. Uh, yeah, in verse 22 through, through 36, you have the testimony of John the Baptist. But if you look, or at least the way I look at it, there, there, there seems to be a connecting thread between these two points. They're not really a, two separate stories. And what, is that, what do you think that connecting thread might be? In my, in my opinion, I think both of them are dealing with the new birth. Now, let's see if we can develop that a little bit. This is the subject that Nicodemus can't quite understand, is the... Uh, uh, the, the rebirth that you must be born again that we, uh, and that that seems to be the central uh, what, what takes the center stage now in chapter one when we first got introduced to John the Baptist he talked about the fact that there was going to be one coming after him that was greater than him that, that, that he baptized with water and another one's going to come baptizing in the spirit and that baptism was going to be greater than his so that, that's, that's, to me, is what connects these two seemingly disparate um, parts of chapter 3. So let's look at, look at the chapter. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say, and again, remember, every time you see truly, truly, or if you're reading King James, verily, verily, that, that's a literary device to let you know that what's coming afterwards is important. So Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of God be lifted up, so that whoever believes, will, whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. 
He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Now, first of all, who is Nicodemus? What do we know about him? All right, he's one of the Sanhedrin. That's what it's referring to when it says a ruler of the Jews. What else do we know about him? He was a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. So he's both a Pharisee and a Sanhedrin. That means he's a, he's a high official in the, within the Jewish system. He is a very devout, righteous believe, uh, uh, follower of the Jews. He is both a Pharisee and a, Sanhedrin, and a member of the Sanhedrin. Now he comes to, to, to Jesus by night. Why does he come by night? Because he was afraid. Good guess. Because he's scared of the light. Good guess. The correct answer after years of theological, deep theological training? Don't. We don't know. No. It could be because the, what you just, both of you just said is very valid. It could be because he was afraid. He was, he was afraid that others would see him being both a Pharisee and a, and a, and a, and a, and a uh, member of the Sanhedrin. May have been because he was so busy doing all the other things he did during the day. Now it was the only time he had. I don't, we don't know. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is he came. And when he came, he immediately addressed him as rabbi. Now, Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a, and a member of the Sanhedrin, his, his ability as a teacher is, is kind of faulty. He's closer to being a rabbi, but he acknowledges Jesus as being a rabbi. He also says in verse 2, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. So he said, because nobody can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So what does that tell us about Nicodemus? Uh, not yet. She said he believed in Jesus. He, he didn't believe in Jesus in the way we think about it about for, for salvation. But he did. He didn't. First of all, he knew about Jesus. He knew what Jesus had done. He recognized that he was empowered by God because only God can do those things. And he recognized that he is a teacher. That, that's, that's what rabbi means. Now, John is introducing in this, in chapter 3, a, a literary device. Um, not, not a literary device, but a, a pattern of Jesus' teaching where Nicodemus makes, in this case, three different questions and Jesus transposes the topic to a, high, to a higher level. He said, Rabbi, we know you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Now, how did Jesus answer? He tells him that he, unless one is born again, they cannot see the king. Yeah, he simply said, you must be born again. Now, th just think of it from, from a conversational standpoint. Do those two sentences connect to each other? Rabbi, we know you're from God, because nobody can do what you do unless God's with him. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus asked again in verse 4. He said, not showing he, he's not understanding, he's, his approach to, G, to, G, to come into Jesus is very well-intentioned, but his, his uh, spiritual perception is very inadequate. He said, how can a man be born a second time? How, as, a, as an old man, as an adult, as a grown-up, how can I crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? And what is, how does Jesus respond to that? He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then he goes on in verse 8 and he says, verse 9, he says, how can these things be? 
And that's when Jesus says, how is it that you're a teacher? How is it that you are uh, a rabbi, a Pharisee, uh, a, a, a ruler of the San, a, a ruler, a member of the ruling party of the Sanhedrin? How is it that you can be at that, at that level and not understand these basic things? Now, when Jesus said, you must be born again, what is he talking about? Obviously, he's talking about salvation. He's talking about a spiritual birth. What is Nicodemus thinking when he hears those words? Physical, physical birth. It's physical versus the, the, uh, the spiritual. Now, I'm not going to give you a Greek term, but the word is... The word that we translate as being born again. In Greek, that word can mean two things. It can mean again. It can also mean from above. Now what is, what is Nicodemus saying? He's, he's thinking physical. He's hearing that word and he's saying, I've got to be born a second time. But what is Jesus saying? Jesus is actually saying you've got to be born from above. How do we know that? Flip the page. Well, you may not on your page, the Bible. On my Bible, I've got to flip the page. Because when you go to... Where's the verse I'm looking for? Verse 31, which we'll get to in a minute. John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. He says, He who comes from above is above all. And he is of the earth, is from the earth, and speaks of it. But he who comes from heaven is above all. So again, he's talking about a spiritual birth. Coming from, being born from above. Being, becoming part of, just like Jesus. Now, Jesus said three times, you must be born again. And there are three results when you see that. When you are born again. He said in verse the three. Yeah. yeah, the first one's three. Unless you are born again, you cannot what? See. You cannot see the kingdom of God. He said in verse five, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then in verse 8, you've got to read between the lines a little bit. He says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is the third, uh, the third element of being born again. Unless you are born again, you can... Well, what's he talking about in verse 8? Anybody ever seen the wind... I, I never have seen it. Where's the wind come from? Different direction. Yeah, but where's it coming from? You know? Nobody knows where it's coming from. You know, is it the same wind that came through yesterday and you just keep going around in a circle? Yeah. Can't see the wind. Where's the wind going? Don't know. But, but I've never said but I felt the wind. I've seen what the wind can do. I've seen damage from the wind. So what's he saying? He's saying that's the Spirit is just like the wind. So he's saying unless you've been born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you've been born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless you've been born again, you cannot... experience the kingdom of God. <coughs> That's what happens when the Spirit comes over us. We experience it. Let me, let me tell you, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. I don't let a whole lot of people know this, but I am an avid Auburn University <laughs> fan. I know, I know, I know you've been wondering all these years. Whoever you're for. And the cathedral at Auburn is Jordan Hare Football, the Jordan Hare Stadium. Beautiful stadium. Holds 88,000. Now, 
It's right in the center of campus, right across the street from the Haley Center, right down across the street from what is now the pharmacy building. At least it was when I was a student there. You can see the stadium from a long way off. You can go to the rooftop of the Haley Center, which is a sort of like a lounge, and you can really get a bird's eye view of the, of the stadium. It's beautiful to be able to see that stadium. But how much of the stadium can I take in just by looking at it? No, what's even better than, the, than seeing the stadium is being able to go into the stadium. Be able to have a ticket and go into the stadium. There, now I have entered the stadium. It was one thing to see it, see it from the outside and see it from a distance or see it from up above, but it's another thing to go into it. But it's an entirely different experience to see that stadium, go into that stadium, and watch a football game there, especially when we beat Alabama, <laughs> which happens more often than other people from Alabama like to mention. Because it's only then that you can experience the game. Now, which one, which one would satisfy you if you were a good Auburn fan? To see the stadium? To enter an empty stadium? Or to experience what takes place? That's what he's saying happens about the kingdom of God. We can see the kingdom of God if we are born again. But what better than that, we can enter into the kingdom of God if we're born again. But even better than that is we can experience the kingdom of God if we're born again. And that's exactly what he's telling Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Those who see, enter, and experience the kingdom must do so must be born from above, which is where, where, where is the, that, that's the place where Jesus originates. So in other words, we need to become just like Jesus who is from above. Now, he tells us in verse 5 the two components of this new birth. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water. Come off of there. And spirit. Jesus says both of those are required. He said, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what do you think Jesus is talking about? All right, let's, let's, let's explore it a little bit then. What do you use water for? You take a bath. And what's the purpose of taking a bath? To get clean. What's the purpose, he said, unless one is born of water? It is baptism, but not the actual, the, the symbolic act of it. You, you remember last week when we talked about the, the, the marriage at Cana, the big water pots that held, held 20, 30 gallons, and he said, fill them up to the brim. What were those water pots used for in, 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 the, in the first century? Cleansing. This whole thing about water is talking about the act of purification. Now, how are we purified spiritually? Through Jesus, but it was, it was a little bit more specific. Holy water. It, 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 what's holy water? Now let's don't chase that rabbit. How do we get right? How do we get purified? How do we get? Uh, are, are we filthy? Yes. yes. How do we get clean? Confess. Confess and there we go. That's what I'm looking for. The water is talking about repentance. And then, of course, the Spirit is talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when we go... 
When we are baptized, first of all, is baptism a requirement to get saved? No. No, it is not. But when we get baptized, what do we? It is a symbol. It is, a, but it's a very powerful symbol. And it's an important symbol. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to minimize baptism at all. But it is not salvific. When we when we go through the the ordinance of baptism, what are what are we showing? What are we symbolizing? What are we modeling? The death and burial of Christ. Death and burial of Christ. The old man has died. Our old sin has been has been has died and been buried. We come in the water. We we're buried in the water and we're raised up, and that represents the cleanliness that comes because the Holy Spirit has now filled us. There are two baptisms. The baptism of the water and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, our somewhat more charismatic friends tell us that you've been baptized by the Spirit when you can speak in tongues and you come of a... that baptism follows salvation. And they will also say that we as Baptists don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we do. Very much we do. We just happen to believe it takes place at the same time as conversion. We also believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, while it is real, is manifest in other ways besides just speaking in tongues. Um, because there's a lot of fruits of the Spirit and a lot of gifts of the Spirit. But unless one is born of the Spirit, of, born of, of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Nic Nicodemus doesn't understand the thing Jesus is telling him. And so that's why he says in verse 9, how can these things be? You can almost just see him, whatever he looks like in your mind, throwing up his hands and saying, I don't understand, I don't get it. How can these things be? That deficit in his thinking is common to those who do not understand heavenly things. Uh, before the day of Pentecost, the, the disciples didn't understand it either. There's a lot that de they didn't understand until after the, the, the resurrection, uh, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and after the ascension. And then when the day of Pentecost came, they finally were able to see. And that's what he says. How can, that's why he asked, how can these things be? And Jesus answers in verse 10, he said, how can you be a teacher and not understand? He said, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. But I tell you earthly things and you don't believe, how are you going to believe heavenly things? And then he goes into a little bit of an explanation. He said, No one's ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is Jesus saying here in these th verses 13 and 14? Talking about his ascension. All right. But first he talks about his descension too. Yep. He said, Nobody's ascended into heaven who didn't first descend from heaven. And he specifically calls him, identifies that as the Son of Man, which as we've studied before, that's the most common term that Jesus used to refer to himself while he's here on this earth. And then in verse 14, using an example that the Jews would understand greatly about the, what Moses did in the wilderness about lifting up the serpent, he, says, even G, he said, even so, even so, the Son of Man will be lifted up. He's telling that, that he's going to die. He's telling us about his crucifixion. And he said, that the, why will the Son of Man be lifted up? Well, verse 15 is the answer to that. So that whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, who gets lifted up, he will have eternal life. And then he goes into verse 16. Now, I'm going to tell you that verses 16 through 19, or 16 through 21, there is somewhat, and I'm only going to bring, I'm not going to try to defend it, I'm not going to try to define it. There is some discussion with, did Jesus say these words? Or are these the words of John as he wrote the gospel? 
I don't know. But my Bible there in red, so I, my word, the word is Jesus. But let me ask you this question. Does it make any difference whether Jesus said it or whether John, the, the disciple, said it, wrote it? Because if you believe in total inspiration of Scripture, which I do, that all Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter which, who actually said it. But in my belief, Jesus said it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Belief in the Son gains eternal life. He said it in verse 15. He said it in verse 16. He said it again in verse 18. No, verse 19. What did God give to mankind? He gave His Son. What did His Son give? He gave His life. And that's what it is. That's the whole... This is, this is what it's all about. Belief in the Son brings eternal life. Disbelief brings judgment and condemnation. He said God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. He didn't come in. He didn't send His Son to condemn the world. He sent His Son to save the world. Jesus Himself said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now why is it that God did not send Jesus to condemn? Or, to use the words that's here, to judge. They've already been judged. Already been judged. Uh, that's what verse 18 says. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Now, how can you be judged already if you haven't believed? Because you, you don't believe. It's really that simple. What do you have to do to go to heaven? When I say you, I'm talking about any, anybody. What do you have to do to go to heaven? You have to be born again. You got to be born again. You got to believe in the Son of God. Right? Isn't that what we just went through? What do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Just be born. <laughs> You're headed there. Gee, God did not send His Son to condemn or to judge because we are already condemned because of the sin nature that we have in us. And He said, this is the judgment. Verse 19, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. But men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Now, you can't have it both ways. You can't have a dab a little bit in the church world, dab a little bit in the evil world, dab a little bit in Jesus, dab a little bit with the flesh, dab a little bit in the Spirit, dab a little bit over here. You can't have it. It says, verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Why is it that more crime gets taken, takes place at night than it does during the daytime? Yeah, they think people are not going to see. Not as many. It's a lot easier to do something you're not supposed to be doing in the dark, isn't it? And by the way, can you function in the dark? How many of you wake up in the middle of the night and have need to have a need to go to the bathroom or wake up for whatever reason? You've been asleep for hours, hopefully. Room as dark as it can be, there's not a light on. You have any trouble seeing? You can't see as good as you can with the light turned on, but you can see pretty well, can't you? The longer you stay in the dark, the better you can see your way, your way around. But when you've been exposed to the light, if all of a sudden the electricity fell right here in this room and everything got pitch black, none of us would be able to see a thing for a while at all, would we? Because we're in the light. Everyone who does evil hates the light. and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to, his light, comes to the light 
so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. That is what it's all about. Light brings exposure. It reveals who we really are. Now, in these 21 verses, what is it that Jesus is trying to say to Nicodemus and to us? You must be born again. Now, just a short sentence. You must be born again. Five words. Only one's got two syllables. You must be born again. Jesus said it three different times, three different ways. Now, when he was talking to Nicodemus, was he talking only to Nicodemus? No, he was talking to all of us. But what, do you, what, what stands out in that sentence? You must be born again. Must. Must. That's the key word to the whole thing. You must be born again. Not an option. You can choose to reject it. But the only way you're going to see the kingdom of God, the only way you're going to enter the kingdom of God, the only way you're going to experience the kingdom of God, the only way you're going to receive that, that, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is if you are born again. Well, now the scene shifts to the work of John the Baptist. In verses 22 through 36, we see John, what a lot of people refer to as John's last testimony. So let's look at the text and then let's see what, what it tells us. Verse 22, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in, I have never known how to pronounce this word, Anon, maybe near Salim. Because there was, much, there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. That's another reason why people think John the disciple wrote this instead of John the Baptist. Again, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who cares? Verse 25, Therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciple about, it with, with, of John's disciple with the Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son, and he's given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, as I said, the scene is shifted to John the Baptist and his disciples. There are some disciples of John that left and followed Jesus. Some are still with John. Jesus comes out to the, uh, to the Jordan River where John is at work, and a, I don't want to say a crisis, but a, but a, but a, but a, but a question comes up, you know? Um, because the disciples of John saw that the disciples of Jesus were growing and growing and growing and getting bigger, and there were, there were more people following Jesus than there were following John, and they said, John, what are we going to do about this? You know? It's almost like it's, uh, the disciples are getting a little 
case of animosity coming up. But John the Baptist responds with a series of testimony that says, no, 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 this is the way it's supposed to be. This is exactly the way it was, the way, way it's supposed to be. He says in verse 27, he said a man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from heaven. So what's he saying? He said God determines the, the success of, of men. These are a series of testimonies that John is making to his disciples. He said, first of all, the success of any ministry comes from God. Nowhere else. Uh, he said in verse 29, he made clear at the outset that he is not the Christ. Or verse 28, he said, I'm not the Christ. He said, he is the bridegroom. He said, I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. Uh, if we're going to keep it in terms of a wedding, the church is the bride, Jesus is the bridegroom, John the Baptist is the best man. Uh, he said, we stand, and we hear, as the best man, I stand and I hear him, and I rejoice greatly when I hear this voice, so my, my, my joy has been made full. Because what John was saying, and John believed, and John practiced, was that we must decrease so that Jesus increases. Now what's all this superiority about of Jesus? It's grounded in his heritage. He's from above. That's what verse 31 tells us. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. John is he's the son has come to us from the Father. But John the Baptist belongs to the earth. John's, John's, because he's from the earth, speaks as one from the earth. But the Son utters the very words of God. In verse 32, he talks about the fact that what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. Yet many people reject his testimony. He's from above. He speaks, John the Baptist speaks as of from the earth. The Spirit talks out a big difference about God because He talks about how the Father loves the Son and given all things into Him. God is speaking through Jesus. God is speaking through John the Baptist. God is speaking through you, through me. As long as the message that we present is pointing everybody back to Jesus. Pointing everybody back to, to Jesus as being the... Well, we want Him to increase while we decrease. But verse 35, Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He has the superior authority. Now, if He has been given to all things, then what else is He, what else is he able to give away? That eternal life. Look at verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Is there a promise in that verse? Verse 36. Is there a promise? Yeah, he, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. All right, promise is eternal life, is it not? Mm -hmm. Is there a condition to that promise? If he doesn't obey. The condition is he who believes in the Son. Now, is there a warning? Wrath of God. There's two warnings, actually. One is what Wanda just mentioned. He who does not obey the Son will not see life. And you could look at that as a promise. I look at it as a warning. Either way, it doesn't make any difference. But the wrath of God abides on him. Why is it that if you believe in the Son, you will have eternal life? Because he's the one that paid the penalty for our sins. Because God ordained it. God gave us his Son. His Son gave us his, his life. And in His death, our sin was paid. And it, when we believe... Now, is it paid for everybody? Is it paid for everybody? When Jesus died on the cross, did He die for everybody's sins? Yes. 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 Will everybody have eternal life? No. 
He who believes in the Son has that eternal life. So, so salvation has been made available to everybody. No matter what you have done, no matter how horrible it may have been, no matter how long you have done it, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the details at all. Jesus died on the cross to pay that penalty for your death. Uh, pay, pay the penalty through His death. And He holds that salvation out. So it's available to everybody. But it is not automatic. You have to receive it. And how do you receive it? By reaching up with your hand, grabbing His, and saying, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Father gave Him all things that He could then give to all people, including an example of new birth to all of us. Like He did, like He offered to Nicodemus. Now, for that reason, that's why I say these two stories that seem so separate are connected. Because they're all being woven together with the thread of the new birth. If you accept Jesus Christ and believe Him as Lord and Savior that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, you repent of those sins, you confess Him as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, will you be saved? Yeah. If you're born again. Well, that's, that's, that's the recipe for being born again. If you believe all that. So let me ask you a question based on what we saw here in chapter 3. Nicodemus was told three times, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. Do not marvel that I said, you must be born again. What was his answer? He said, I don't understand. How can these things be? Three times he was told, you must be born again. When we get to heaven, are we going to run into a man named Nicodemus? Are we going to see Nicodemus? Is that what you said? Are we, yeah, we're going to run into the the streets of heaven. Are we going to run into a man named Nicodemus? I think so. Well, let's clear that up. Because chapter 3 doesn't tell us. We only read about Nicodemus two more times. Turn over to, to John chapter 7. People are arguing about Jesus and the Pharisees are trying to decide what to do with Him. Verse 45. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, Why did you not bring Him? But the officers answered, Never has a man... The, the, the background of this was the Pharisees told him to go arrest Jesus, basically, and bring him, to, bring him to Him. They said, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. And the Pharisees then answered them, saying... You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers of Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, verse 50, he who came to him before being one of them, one of what? One of the Pharisees, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? And they answered him and said, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. So Jesus, you see in verse 50, while they're trying to accuse and judge and try Jesus, Nicodemus speaks up for him. Does that mean Nicodemus was saved? Is he sympathetic to Jesus? Or being, a, being the, leader of the, the ruler of the Jews and being a Pharisee, is he more concerned about following the letter of the law. He said, Our law says we do not judge a man unless we hear from him first and know what he's doing. 
So is he sympathetic to Jesus? Is he a believer? We still don't know. But there's another clue. The second time we read about Nicodemus is in John chapter 19. And at this point, Jesus is hanging on the cross. He is dead. It's approaching sunset uh, on Friday night. And sunset means that's the beginning of the Sabbath. Jewish law said that a corpse, a body, is not to be left exposed on the Sabbath. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices as is the burial custom of the Jews. So who was it that buried and anointed the body of Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. I think there's no doubt in my mind Nicodemus became a believer. He was very secretive about it, but I believe we will see him walk in the streets of heaven. And I'm not going to ask him, why were you so secretive about it? Because he's going to ask me, why were you? So, through this, the encounter with Nicodemus and the testimony of John the Baptist, we get the message that you must be born again. And that is the only way you'll be able to, born from above, that's the only way in which we'll be able to experience the kingdom of God. Questions, comments? Verses 13 and 14. All right. But first he talks about his descension too. Yeah. He said nobody's ascended into heaven who didn't first descend from heaven. And he specifically calls him, identifies that as the Son of Man, which as we've studied before, that's the most common term that Jesus used to refer to himself while he was here on this earth. And then in verse 14, using an example that the Jews would understand greatly about the what Moses did in the wilderness about lifting up the serpent, he says, even G, he said, even so, even so, the Son of Man will be lifted up. He's telling that, that he's going to die. He's telling us about his crucifixion. And he said, that the, why will the Son of Man be lifted up? Well, verse 15 is the answer to that. So that whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, who gets lifted up, he will have eternal life. And then he goes into verse 16. Now I'm going to tell you that verses 16 through 19, or 16 through 21, there is somewhat, and I'm only going to, I'm not going to try to defend it, I'm not going to try to define it. There is some discussion with, did Jesus say these words? Or are these the words of John as he wrote the gospel? I don't know. But my Bible there in red, so that my word, the word is Jesus. But let me ask you this question. Does it make any difference whether Jesus said it or whether John, the, the disciple, said it, wrote it? Because if you believe in total inspiration of Scripture, which I do, that all Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter which, who actually said it. But in my belief, Jesus said it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Belief in the Son gains eternal life. He said it in verse 15. He said it in verse 16. He said it again in verse 18. No, verse 19. What did God give to mankind? He gave His Son. What did His Son give? He gave His life. And that's what it is. That's the whole... 
this is, this is what it's all about. Belief in the Son brings eternal life. Disbelief brings judgment and condemnation. He said God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. He didn't come in. He didn't send His Son to condemn the world. He sent His Son to save the world. Jesus Himself said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now why is it that God did not send Jesus to condemn? Or, to use the words that's here, to judge. They've already been judged. Uh, that's what verse 18 says. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Now, how can you be judged already if you haven't believed? Because you don't believe. It's really that simple. What do you have to do to go to heaven? When I say you, I'm talking about any, anybody. What do you have to do to go to heaven? You have to be born again. You got to believe in the Son of God. Right? Isn't that what we just went through? What do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Just be born. <laughs> You're headed there. Gee, God did not send His Son to condemn or to judge because we are already condemned because of the sin nature that we have in us. And He said... This is the judgment. Verse 19, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. But men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Now, you can't have it both ways. You can't have a dab a little bit in the church world, dab a little bit in the evil world. Dab a little bit in Jesus, dab a little bit with the flesh. Dab a little bit in the Spirit, Dab a little bit over here. You can't have it. It says, verse 20, Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Why is it that more crime gets taken, takes place at night than it does during the daytime? Yeah, they think people are not going to see night. Isn't it? It's a lot easier to do something you're not supposed to be doing in the dark, isn't it? And by the way, can you function in the dark? How many of you wake up in the middle of the night and have a need to have a need to go to the bathroom or wake up for whatever reason? You've been asleep for hours, hopefully. Room as dark as it can be, there's not a light on. You have any trouble seeing? You can't see as good as you can with the light turned on, but you can see pretty well, can't you? The longer you stay in the dark, the better you can see your way, your way around. But when you've been exposed to the light, if all of a sudden the electricity fell right here in this room and everything got pitch black, none of us would be able to see a thing for a while at all, would we? Because we're in the light. Everyone who does evil hates the light. and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to his light, comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. That is what it's all about. Light brings exposure. It reveals who we really are. Now, in these 21 verses, what is it that Jesus is trying to say to Nicodemus and to us? You must be born again. Now, just a short sentence. You must be born again. Five words. Only one's got two syllables. You must be born again. Jesus said it three different times, three different ways. Now, when he was talking to Nicodemus, was he talking only to Nicodemus? No, he was talking to all of us. But what, do you, what, what stands out in that sentence? You must be born again. Must. 
must. That's the key word to the whole thing. You must be born again. Not an option. You can choose to reject it. But the only way you're going to see the kingdom of God, the only way you're going to enter the kingdom of God, the only way you're going to experience the kingdom of God, the only way you're going to receive that, that, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is if you are born again. Well, now the scene shifts to the work of John the Baptist. In verses 22 through 36, we see John, what a lot of people refer to as John's last testimony. So let's look at the text and then let's see what, what it tells us. Verse 22, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in, I have never known how to pronounce this word, Anon, maybe near Salim. Because there was, much, there was much water there. And people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. That's another reason why people think John the disciple wrote this instead of John the Baptist. Again, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who cares? Verse 25, Therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciple about it with, with, of John's disciple with the Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son, and he's given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, as I said, the scene is shifted to John the Baptist and his disciples. There are some disciples of John that left and followed Jesus. Some are still with John. Jesus comes out to the, uh, to the Jordan River where John is at work, and a, I don't want to say a crisis, but a, but a, but a, but a, but a question comes up, you know? Um, because the disciples of John saw that the disciples of Jesus were growing and growing and growing and getting bigger, and there were, there were more people following Jesus than there were following John, and they said, John, what are we going to do about this? You know? It's almost like it's, uh, the disciples are getting a little case of animosity coming up, but John the Baptist responds with a series of testimony that says, no, 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 this is the way it's supposed to be. This is exactly the way it was, the way, way it's supposed to be. He says in verse 27, he said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from heaven. So what's he saying? He said, God determines the, the success of, of men. These are a series of testimonies that John is making to his disciples. He said, first of all, the success of any ministry comes from God, nowhere else. Uh, he said in verse 29, he made clear at the outset that he is not the Christ. Or verse 28, he said, I'm not the Christ. He said, he is the bridegroom. He said, I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. Uh, if we're going to keep it in terms of a wedding, the church is the bride, Jesus is the bridegroom, John the Baptist is the best man. Uh, he said, we stand and we hear, as the best man, I stand and I hear him and I rejoice greatly when I hear this voice of so my my." my Joy has been made full because what John was saying and John believed and John practiced was that we must decrease 
so that Jesus increases. Now what's all this superiority about of Jesus? It's grounded in his heritage. He's from above. That's what verse 31 tells us. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. John, is, his, the Son has come to us from the Father. But John the Baptist belongs to the earth. John, John's, because he's from the earth, speaks as one from the earth. But the Son utters the very words of God. In verse 32, he talks about the fact that what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. Yet many people reject his testimony. He's from above. He speaks, John the Baptist speaks as of from the earth. The Spirit talks out a big difference about God because he talks about how the Father loves the Son and given all things into him. God is speaking through Jesus. God is speaking through John the Baptist. God is speaking through you, through me. As long as the message that we present is pointing everybody back to Jesus. Pointing everybody back to, to, to Jesus as being the... Well, we want Him to increase while we decrease. But verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He has the superior authority. Now, if He has been given all things, then what else is He, what else is he able to give away? That eternal life. Look at verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Is there a promise in that verse? Verse 36. Is there a promise? Yeah, he, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. All right, promise is eternal life, is it not? Is there a condition to that promise? If he doesn't obey. The condition is he who believes in the Son. Now, is there a warning? There's two warnings, actually. One is what Wanda just mentioned. He who does not obey the Son will not see life. Now you could look at that as a promise. I look at it as a warning. Either way, it doesn't make any difference. But the wrath of God abides on him. Why is it that if you believe in the Son, you will have eternal life? Because he's the one that paid the penalty for our sin. Because God ordained it. God gave us his Son. His Son gave us his, his life. And in His death, our sin was paid. And it, when we believe... Now, is it paid for everybody? Is it paid for everybody? When Jesus died on the cross, did He die for everybody's sins? Yes. 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 Will everybody have eternal life? No. He who believes in the Son has that eternal life. So, so salvation has been made available to everybody. No matter what you have done, no matter how horrible it may have been, no matter how long you have done it, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the details at all. Jesus died on the cross to pay that penalty for your death. Uh, pay, pay the penalty through his death. And he holds that salvation out. So it's available to everybody. But it is not automatic. You have to receive it. And how do you receive it? By reaching up with your hand. Grabbing his. And saying, I believe Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Father gave him all things. That he could then give to all people including an example of new birth to all of us. Like he did, like he offered to Nicodemus. Now,
For that reason, that's why I say these two stories that seem so separate are connected because they're all being woven together with the thread of the new birth. If you accept Jesus Christ and believe Him as Lord and Savior that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, you repent of those sins, you confess Him as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, will you be saved? Yeah. If you're born again. Well, that's, that's, that's the recipe for being born again. If you believe all that. So let me ask you a question based on what we saw here in chapter 3. Nicodemus was told three times, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. Do not marvel that I said, you must be born again. What was his answer? He said, I don't understand. How can these things be? Three times he was told, you must be born again. When we get to heaven, are we going to run into a man named Nicodemus? Are we going to see Nicodemus? Is that what you said? Are we, yeah, we're going to run into... Walk in the streets of heaven. Are we going to run into a man named Nicodemus? I don't think so. Well, let's clear that up. Because chapter 3 doesn't tell us. We only read about Nicodemus two more times. Turn over to, to John chapter 7. People are arguing about Jesus and the Pharisees are trying to decide what to do with him. Verse 45. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, why did you not bring him? But the officers answered, never has a man... The, the, the background of this was the Pharisees told him to go arrest Jesus, basically, and bring him, to, bring him to him. They said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. And the Pharisees then answered them saying, you have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers of Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, verse 50, he who came to him before being one of them, one of what? One of the Pharisees, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? And they answered him and said, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. So Jesus, you see in verse 50, while they're trying to accuse and judge and try Jesus, Nicodemus speaks up for him. Does that mean Nicodemus was saved? Is he sympathetic to Jesus? Or being, a, being the, leader of the, uh, the ruler of the Jews and being a Pharisee, is he more concerned about following the letter of the law. He said, Our law says we do not judge a man unless we hear from him first. And no way doing. So is he sympathetic to Jesus? Is he a believer? We still don't know. But there's another clue. The second time we read about Nicodemus is in John chapter 19. And at this point, Jesus is hanging on the cross. He is dead. It's approaching sunset uh, on Friday night. And sunset means that's the beginning of the Sabbath. Jewish law said that a corpse of body is not to be left exposed on the Sabbath. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices as is the burial custom of the Jews. 
So who was it that buried and anointed the body of Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. I think there's no doubt in my mind Nicodemus became a believer. He was very secretive about it, but I believe we will see him walk in the streets of heaven. And I'm not going to ask him, why were you so secretive about it? Because he's going to ask me, why were you? So, through this, the, the uh, encounter with Nicodemus and the testimony of John the Baptist, we get the message that you must be born again. And that is the only way you'll be able to born from above that's the only way in which we'll be able to experience the kingdom of god questions comments